Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my new series of Author Insights podcast, where I get to interview the people who I've worked with on their writing projects. And the first person I've got onto the show, I'm delighted to say, is a young woman who's written an extraordinary novel called The Boy Who Saw in Colours, which we're going to talk about later. She lives in Derry in Northern Ireland. She's got a fascinating background story to tell. So allow me to welcome to the show the very first of these podcasts, Lauren Robinson. Hello there, Lauren. Hi, Henry. Thank you for having me today. Uh, we'll reveal to the listeners that, in fact, we had a slight technical problem where we'd been chatting away already for a few minutes until I noticed that I hadn't actually clicked the record button correctly. <laughs> so, yeah, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, we've re- we've kind of rehearsed the first few minutes of this show. So hopefully you'll see the difference in quality. But anyway, Lauren, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's brilliant to talk to you again because, I mean, apart from anything else, over the months we've been working together... You know, we've developed a friendship, which is really lovely. And uh, it's been a great experience that, you know, we're, we're going to talk about later. But I think, first of all, uh, to give the ladies and gentlemen uh, a bit of background about yourself uh, and explain a little bit about, you know, where you're from, where you've been, what your journey has been kind of in a real sense up to this point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm from a small town in Northern Ireland called Derry. And that's where I grew up. And I lived there until I was 16 years old. And then my family moved to Australia, um, we, Melbourne, Australia. And we were there for six years before returning to Ireland again. So um, you moved there when you were 16. Uh, you're, in your, you're in your mid-20s now, of course. So how, how long have you been back in Derry then, Lauren? Um, it's been two years Right. OK, so you you had quite a chunk of time out in Australia. So tell, tell us something about what it was like, you know, because uh, obviously at the, the age you were at, that would have been meant a major upheaval in kind of the, your education. So how did you find the change? How did you find, you know, uh, get move, moving into the education system in Australia rather than you know staying in Northern Ireland? And what was your kind of life experience in in Australia? Was it a positive thing for you? Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it definitely was a positive thing. Um, before we left, I was going through a bit of a rough patch here in, in Derry. My my grades were not where I wanted them to be at all. And I, I had very little friends. So I saw Australia as a little bit of a, a, a new beginning for me. And so I went over there with the mindset that, that things were going to get better. I would make friends and I would get good grades, which 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 I did do, which which is good. Yeah. Um, but the schooling system is very different over there. So instead of doing eight subjects like we do here, there's only six. Right. And and maths and science aren't compulsory, which I was thrilled to hear because they are not <laughs> my strong points at all. <laughs> and um, kids had a little bit more of um. They, they had a little bit more um room with what they wanted to study um right. they, they, they could, yeah so they're more is a more flexible education system over there was it yeah absolutely they, they played at the kids strengths over there quite a bit right yeah, because uh, from what I know about uh, what little I know about the education system in Northern Ireland, I do know it's very highly regarded here that, oh, gosh, kids in Northern Ireland, they're pushed quite hard. They they get good grades. They study a lot of things. But that also, I imagine, means that there's a lot of pressure on school kids in Northern Ireland. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. It's like you said, it, it is a very high standard and you need to get quite good grades to get onto university, especially to study a subject that I'm currently studying, journalism. Right. And, you know, it, you know, some kids just, um, their, their, their strengths are in, in one particular subject and not mm. so much in another subject. Mm. And I feel like the schooling system here is quite bad because you're, you're, you're judging a kid on something that they, they can't, mm. that, that they it's not their strength, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I, I can remember because I'm I'm certainly old enough, a great deal older than you, and I was at uh, school at a time where uh, you were forced into a certain curriculum, 
uh, you know, it was a grammar school, old fashioned grammar school, where you were forced to study quite a few subjects that you were really thinking, do you know what, this really isn't my shtick. So, you know, I, I can understand where you're coming from there. But the, so you, you had all those years in Australia, which, of course, is a very different place. It's a huge continent, you know, got its own climate and everything and vast size. And I believe that you kind of you were living in the Melbourne area. Is that right? I was, yeah. But you got a chance to travel around a bit? Yeah, I made a really good friend when I was living in Australia and we we travelled. We went on many, many road trips together. We travelled to New South Wales and and, and Brisbane. Um, the only place we didn't get to visit, unfortunately, was Western Australia. Which is where all the, uh, I think a lot of us, when we think of Australia, uh, that's kind of the area we, we think of, really. You know, that kind of... Uh, almost wild west atmosphere right with you don't want to get stuck out in the outback out there right <laughs> yeah that's, that's where all the the big scary animals are with snakes and the spiders and all yeah i think they don't have to be big to be scary in australia do that they'll all kill you <laughs> and the birds over there are bloody insane they <laughs> So, Lauren, over there in Australia, it's full of dangerous creatures. Did you have any experiences with nasty beasties yourself? Um, thankfully, I didn't. Well, where we were in Melbourne, we were in the suburb area, and there isn't really any spiders and snakes and such there. Right. But my parents did, I believe. Um, thankfully, I wasn't in the house at the time, so I, I don't know, but it was it was quite a large spider that's in the house. <laughs> My mom's terrified of spiders, and she sprayed it with fly killer. And my dad, <laughs> because uh, they they have a tendency to jump out at you if they are cornered. Yeah, and she freaked out. So, but thankfully, that was the only time we had any run-ins with the wildlife. Right. Well, thank goodness for that, because you know, I've seen enough documentaries about about funnel website spiders and redback spiders, and goodness knows what it's like. Yeah, that, that's a part of Australia that I'm happy to leave behind. So anyway, you, you had an interesting time there in uh, in Australia. Um, and um, so you've you've we've explained a bit about your interesting accent and your, your background in Australia. And you, then you ended up coming back to Northern Ireland and you're now studying journalism. So uh, whereabouts did you know what inspired you to want to study journalism? Well, initially, when I was around 15, 16 years old, I, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write novels. Right. That's what I wanted to do for my career. But as I got older, I started to realize that it would be a little bit more realistic to go down um, a different career path, something that I could definitely get a, get a job doing and make a living from. So I thought journalism would be kind of the, the logical the, the logical. Um, career to, to get into if you want to be a writer yeah and so that's where I came from right and and have you found that that has been useful that actually the studying the journalism has helped you kind of learn disciplines as it were about writing that you wouldn't have otherwise learned yeah absolutely I I learned a lot about um writing itself writing for for for, for specific people for specific genres yeah which has been really useful for writing novels obviously when it comes to to, to marketing the novel um, but also I thought initially I thought that I would be a journalist first for a few years and I would go off and I would write novels and people would know who I am. Yeah. But for me, it happened the other way around. So I published my first novel and I haven't even finished studying yet. <laughs> right. Which is, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, when it comes to the journalism course, have um, I mean, I, I, I don't know nowadays because in, back in the old days, I thought about studying journalism and of course the only journalism there was to study back then really was newspaper journalism and you'd be expected to start on a local paper and all that kind of stuff. But of course nowadays journalism covers so many different things. I mean obviously yes there are still newspapers, magazines, uh, television and stuff but a great deal of journalism now of course is online journalism you know when, you know, whether it's HuffPost or you know other, other kind of uh, online formats even you know photojournalism journalism, video journalism, all that kind of stuff. Uh, was there a particular aspect of journalism that appeals to you more than others? 
Um, not necessarily. I I know for sure that I, I want to be a writer, so something like a columnist mm. or something. Mm. I definitely don't want to get into the reporting side of things. Um, I always wanted to be a writer, so... But, but as for what kind of journalism I want to get into, I haven't really thought about it, to be honest. I Maybe something like sports journalism would be cool. Um, mm. I, I don't really want to get into the political, political side of things. Um, just because I know, I mean, journalism, journalists get a really bad rap. Yeah. And I understand the reasoning for it, but I mean, not all journalists are the same. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think that's partly, obviously, because certainly in this country, we've got a reputation um, with the tabloid press um, who, yeah. shall we say, often. Mm, how can one put this uh, diplomatically often distort stories for their own ends uh, <laughs> but, yeah very very poor journalism in some parts yeah so but obviously you're saying that you, you'd like to you know obviously if you're a columnist that's a great thing to be because apart from anything else it's a good regular income and you're getting a, a good thing but anyway yeah. you you said you know you decided uh quite early on when you're about 16 that oh yeah what i actually want to do is to write a novel and yeah, blow yeah. me down with a feather lauren what have you gone and done you've written a novel which is fantastic and yeah any of our listeners out there know that that in itself is a huge achievement because the number of people who say oh i could write a book about that but it's only a tiny fraction who even sit down and start writing a book and it's an even tinier fraction who finish yeah. that book and an even tiny minuscule proportion of people who then get their book either published or do as you've done, which is to self-publish. And I think one of the most yeah. extraordinary things about your book, The Boy Who Saw in Colours, Lauren, is that you decided to go down the self-publishing route despite the fact that you got an offer from Simon & Schuster. So please, uh, well, there's a number of questions in there, isn't there? First of all, um, w uh, what was it about the offer from Simon and Schuster that made you think, no, do you know what? I want to self-publish instead. Tell us a little bit about that, you know, as much as you can without breaking any confidences, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, obviously, I don't I don't want to go after Simon and Schuster or anything like that. Mm. But basically, basically, whenever we were talking about um, changes to the story. And of course, I anticipated that there would be small changes. That was mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. But there was one quite large change um, that I that I wasn't I wasn't willing to I wasn't willing to to get rid of because right. because it would change character quite a bit. Right. And so I just thought that it just wasn't for me. So I decided to go down the self-publishing right well that's incredibly brave of you because i know that there's a large number of people out there who Absolutely. if they were made given an offer by simon and schuster uh <laughs> they would have you know taken the right arm off uh exactly. and uh, you know and there are a lot of people of course who say well you know if a publisher says i should make major changes or oh, i'll make the major changes so i get the deal so it's incredibly mm -hmm. brave of you to have gone down the other route so before we talk about the specifics of the process that that then entailed tell us something about what inspired you to write this particular book i mean we should tell the listeners that it's set in nazi germany during World War yep. Two, for the most part, there's a few glimpses outside that time period, uh, but it's yep. mostly set in an elite Nazi school during World War Two, following the lives of uh, one person in particular and his brother and his school schoolmates. And uh, this lad has a special kind of uh, condition um, and an interesting background that, uh, t to my mind, I mean, I was, when I first, you know, saw the manuscript, it was like, wow, that's absolutely extraordinary. That's not a story that I've ever seen or heard told before. And um, it's a story that, you know, for some people, they may consider it quite a controversial story. So, of course, yep. you know, People sitting, you know, interested in your book are going to be interested to know what on earth 
gripped you so much. How did the, 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 the seed of this story even come about? Because it's not the kind of story that you'd think would pop into most people's heads <laughs> at all. So tell us yeah. something about, you know, the, the process you went through, Lauren, that, that turned this germ of an idea into actually a finished piece. Well, quite honestly, I, I would love to be able to say that I had this 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 vision or something and this story came to me, but it wasn't anything like that. Mm. For me, it was a series of flukes, really. Mm. So it was during the time that we were learning about World War II history in, I think it was year 11 English class in oh, Australia. Right. right. And I... Like, I'm a huge history geek, so I decided to do my own research. Mm -hmm. And I, I came across this photo of this boy, um, and he was he, he was quite upset. It was a German boy, and he, he was quite upset. He was wearing um, a uniform. Mm -hmm. And really, I, I just got me thinking. I just had a connection with the photo, and it got me thinking about what his life was like, what he was taught, mm -hmm. and why he was so upset in the photo. Yeah. And so I started doing more research into that side of things and I came across Hitler Youth and then I went further down that rabbit hole and got to these elite schools. Mm -hmm. And not very many people know about these schools or, or know about um, the German side of the history. Yeah. So I thought I needed to, to write about it mm -hmm. even a little bit and I started off writing short stories about it. Right. And then it formed into a novel as time went on. Mm. So, um, when you say it formed into a novel, it's yeah, it's over ninety thousand words, Lauren. And I know because I've <laughs> laid, I've laid out every single one of those words. <laughs> now that's that's quite a thing. I mean, because uh, particularly for a first time author, a debut author, um, I, you know, you can imagine people, you know, as you say, the, the idea of short stories based around this. I can understand also the notion of you 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 stumble across a photograph in your research, mm. and and of course one of the things that does and you described it there's this picture and I I know the picture of course I uh, that you've there's this boy uh, and I think he's been captured towards the end of the war hasn't he and he's yeah. he's very very emotional uh, and you know probably terrified bless his heart and hungry and you know there's this photograph of him and it's very very raw i mean there's it bypasses there's nothing intellectual about this photograph it's a, a hugely raw emotional photograph so i can imagine how that's triggered the urge to write about that but of course as you say it, it could have just stopped as you know a short story or even a poem or something like that but then you've made this discovery about these uh, elite Nazi schools that, uh, you know, boys sometimes willingly, often not willingly, went to, were sent to. So tell us something a bit more about, uh, first of all, that, that process of inspiration, Lauren, that... Uh, that that photo triggered you know uh, did you find yourself uh, mulling over it for days or weeks or months even making notes about it or did you find that you just wanted to get everything down on paper in one massive you know splurge a furore scrivendi as it's called uh, yeah, initially I did write down a lot of my thoughts and feelings on, on paper when I saw the photo, but it, it, like you said, it is a very raw, powerful photo and it mm -hmm. stuck with me for, for many, many, many weeks afterwards and mm -hmm. is still with me today. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to capture that raw emotional feeling in my writing. So that's interesting. But also the schools. I mean, how did you stumble on this information about these these Nazi schools? And how did that, you know, how did that make you feel? You know, what? because that's a massive discovery that I think you're quite right. Most people know nothing about 
this and the you know the Hitler Youth. I think they th they think of Hitler Youth. Yes, they see the the marching parades and all that kind of stuff. You know, with the these young people in their brown uniforms carrying the swastikas and what have you. But uh, yeah, yeah, I would say the vast majority of people, uh, all but you know a few specialist researchers, probably know nothing about those schools. So tell us something about that discovery, Lauren, about you know this this little piece of history that, of course, is incredibly important because it was spread you know the, the nazi uh philosophy as it were you know um uh inculcating these children into what we now recognize was a vile philosophy so, so tell us something about that lauren and those schools yeah absolutely so i find them by watching an interview and it was it was about this man who was in hitler youth when he was when he was a kid and mm he mentioned that one of his friends was sent to one of these elite schools because he was quite athletic. Right. And I, I wondered what on earth these schools were. So I, I did more research into them and I was disgusted, honestly, when I, sure. when I, when I saw the schools, Yeah. because a lot of these kids are, so some of them go by choice because they think it's what their parents would want for them. And yeah. because they think it's what, Germany would want for them too, yeah. but a lot of them are forced into going here because they they they, they are um, athletic or because they're they're, they're brainy in some way, mm. and so it, it was quite quite sad. And of course, it's um, the, the the really disgusting thing that uh, probably the biggest association we have with the whole Nazi creed is, of course, eugenics and this notion that uh, what the the Germans are building with these schools is an Aryan elite uh, yeah. and of course uh, your book contains a a really startling irony in that uh, <laughs> because your lead character is yeah. not purely Aryan uh, is he um, and yeah. so he find, th th I think this is one of the most gripping things about this central character is that there are a couple of things about him in fact that um were the authorities to realize um he could he could end up being shot and dead in the ditch uh in the blink of an eye um and i'm not going to reveal what those secrets are because we want people to go and read your book lauren but i think yeah, it's uh, i think it's um worth mentioning you know uh that if people want to come to your book, they mustn't imagine that this is just some kind of uh, apologia for, you know, the Aryan creed or the Nazi culture. Absolutely the opposite. And I think that's yeah. one of the things that's most um, kind of disturbing for the reader is that they find themselves wrapped up in these characters who, of course, are... Uh, uh, subject to intense Nazi propaganda the whole time uh, and it's actually one of the most interesting things is the way that the lead character in particular but not just the lead character uh, the way that they react to being uh, you know brainwashed in this particular way it's it makes for a fascinating story now Obviously, you know, this is where I have to confess, Lauren, that I have an interest in, in, in the success of your story because uh, yeah. you, we, we found each other, you found me quite a long time ago now. I've, I actually have slipped yeah, my mind how long we've been working together on this in one form or another. Um, but perhaps you could, you know, you could just tell the listeners how you stumbled upon me a few months ago. How did that Yeah, happen? absolutely. I... I believe it was November of last year. Yeah, I was I was looking into um, cover designers for for the novel, and I stumbled upon um, this this lady who I thought was was who I thought her her portfolio looked quite nice. So yeah. I gave her an email, and she was fully booked up, and she recommended me to you. So that's that's how I stumbled upon you, and then of course we we got talking. Yeah. initially just about cover design and then it well it fairly quickly moved on to other things too i think the word we'd have to use is snowballed <laughs> absolutely yeah it just just kept going yeah uh, i think the the lady in question we uh, that i 
have to thank profusely for making this introduction is, is Jane Dixon Smith. I think it was Jane Dixon Smith yeah. you probably contacted first. And she is indeed a highly, well, she's a brilliant, highly successful and extremely busy uh, cover designer. Uh, yeah. And um, I know she has the you know particular genres that she specialises in. And, and I can imagine, to be honest, Lauren, most cover designers would probably look at your story and go, ooh, uh. <laughs> right absolutely what's that absolutely. now it just so happened that of, out of all the cover designers in the universe who you could have stumbled upon you happen to have stumbled upon a guy who's not just a cover designer but i do interior layout and design as well but also more than just a history nut i actually studied this period of history at university uh so mm -hmm. world war ii stuff and i happen to also speak fluent german because you're uh, there are bits of the text where people talk where you first of all you give their what they say in german which is another uh, kind of fantastic, you know, uh, aspect of this book that it really kind of grounds the novel in a particular time, in a particular place. So um, I think it's fair to say that, w you know, when you when we got talking, it was like my brain was going off, you know, lights were flashing. I was thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe that she's talking about this. And then, you know, you mentioned the historical research because... Um, I ended up, for, for complicated reasons which we didn't go into, I ended up actually uh, doing a line edit of, of your text. I didn't do a developmental edit, but I did a line edit of your text. And yes. uh, and I was able to say to you, oh, Lauren, uh, that's a really interesting thing that you've written there, but did you know that that thing didn't actually exist in 1943 <laughs> or whatever it was? And I think yes. between us, one yes. of the most fun things of you know the relationship we built up was on the research side where we were able to have these great exchanges where I discovered, oh, that's, you know, because if a purist reads this book, you know, someone who knows their history really well, they will go, oh, ha, 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 that's wrong. They didn't have that in, you know, in Munich in 1943 so yeah. finding stuff that would fit and some of the things we discovered were amazing weren't they things like yeah, uh, absolutely chocolate i mean i think we you know to give the, the listeners an example one of the things we had this uh, discussion about was you had a scene where uh, the boys had some bars of chocolate or whatever and yeah. I, I was able to point out, oh, actually, uh, because of rationing and all the rest of it, uh, that just wouldn't have happened in Germany at that time. So we yeah. we found this other stuff because they're in this elite Nazi school where they, you know, a bit of kind of black market activity. They could have got hold of this stuff called Flieger Schokolade. Right, yeah. which is this amazing kind of high powered, high cocoa content mixed with all sorts of other stuff to keep you awake, really, that was issued to frontline troops. Uh, and it came in, you know, canisters that look a bit like film canisters. And, you know, I didn't know this stuff existed until we started doing the research to, you know, plug that hole. Um, and <laughs> all sorts of little things like that popped up, right? Yeah, like many things like that. J just to add to that as well, we. There was another scene. Actually, a lot of this novel involves food. There was another scene with, with cookies. Oh, yes, that's and, right. And you pointed out to me that actually they wouldn't have had cookies then. They wouldn't have been introduced to Germany until the Americans came, Yeah, which is very interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. It's all those little details that yeah. uh, I, I think first, you know, it, it gives uh, the, you know, it's background stuff. It's obviously is peripheral stuff. But it's it's also the kind of thing that you come away remembering, isn't it? Uh, because, again, it was like, um, I think there was something else about marker pens as well, where I pointed out, oh, yeah, marker pens, 1950, whatever it was. And so we changed it to chalks or whatever it was. But uh, I, I've... Uh, I found that that kind of background material, because normally when you study history, right, it's all the big things. It's like, you know, Hitler giving his speeches at Nuremberg rallies. It's the German armies marching into France or Russia or whatever it happens to be. All those kind of big, momentous things. But... Uh, yeah. it, in people's real lives, it's all—it's actually all these little things, right? Isn't it? The fact yeah. that 
Yeah, okay, they didn't have chocolate cookies because they were brought over by the Americans. Uh, this cho- There was only this chocolate available because of, you know, rationing that had been in ever since, you know, the German Depression and all the rest of it. Um, so many little things. And I think... Uh, uh, as part of the writing process, you must have found this interesting because, as you say, I mean, some of the the themes in your book obviously are really big and powerful themes. But also yeah. one of the things that I found most moving about your book is uh, that you have lots of tiny little delicate details as well, lots of kind of intimacy in the book. So, so tell yeah. us something about uh you know how because a historical novel in a sense is a unique combination of these things isn't it laura and you've got these great big Absolutely. themes going on in the background but what you're focusing on the reader on is the 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 small intimate details of these young men's boys lives so how did you find was that difficult for you to balance that um, no, I I don't think it was difficult. I knew going into the novel that I wanted it to be a very character driven novel mm. and not so um, relying on plot. Mm. Um, so I knew that I, I wanted it to include very, very intimate details. And I think at times it, it almost comes across as the reader is kind of invading somebody's privacy in a sense that we're... Yeah. We're, we're looking in at a moment that we shouldn't be because it is so personal and so intimate yeah. between two characters. Yeah. But I, I, I love that kind of stuff. I love writing about it. Mm. And it was, it was really interesting and unique to really get inside of, of Yosef's head, the protagonist, mm. and write about his, his story. Because I think that's one of the other things, of course, that your protagonists are, are you know, he's a boy. Uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, most most of the uh, um, inhabitants of this school are young boys. Uh, yeah. That in itself, of course, is a challenge because um, you know you, you don't want to turn it into accidentally into a sort of a down with school kind of you know, <laughs> uh, which which could be very easy because you know b- boys often are uh silly and stupid and and say rubbish stuff so it's quite a balancing act isn't it to get across the fact that yes these are young exuberant boys but at the same time they have an inner life which is uh, at times startlingly adult first of all as a young woman writing about young boys how, how did you find that was that challenging not really. Um, for for writing the boys, I I took a lot of inspiration from my own childhood. Right. Whenever I was a kid, I I used to hang around with a lot of boys, mm-hmm. so I had very little friends that were females. Right. So I have quite I have first hand experience of what what boys are like, and like you said, they are really silly and and rambunctious and sometimes not very clever at all. Mm. But I thought that that was a really good contrast for the story because it really it really shows us how silly the ideas of Nazi Germany were to begin with. Yeah. That these kids, these they're, they're young kids and they were asking questions about just about how everything was working like with the mm. with the Jewish people and and such. Yeah. And it was it was the children that were asking the questions, not the adults. Yeah, it was just very upside down in Nazi Germany. Absolutely, and also, I mean, uh, we should. It's not just all children. There are a few mm. key adult characters, uh, you know, it, it, teachers and so forth at the, at the school, and I think they're very beautifully drawn because they they they're not central to you know most of what goes on, but they are there, and. Uh, I think the point you just made that uh, that a lot of uh, adults in Nazi Germany obviously, I think, swallowed the message easier than some of the kids did, right? Uh, yeah. But it's also the fact that it would be very easy to just caricature 
those individuals in some way. But in fact, again, I think you've you've been very deft in the way that you've shown that these are real people. They're not just ciphers. They are people who have an inner life. They're not just kind of uh, caricature uh, Heil Hitler Nazis. Um, yeah. And that they're complex individuals. And I think to me, one of the interesting things as a historian I've always been interested in uh, particularly in military history, is the way it's so easy to demonise the enemy by just mm -hmm. caricaturing them as one particular thing, you know, with with no nuances, no uh, no shades of grey. And I think what you've done beautifully, Lauren, is you've drawn these people very much with shades of grey. And uh, was that something you wanted to achieve from the get-go in your writing? That was something that happened quite quite naturally. One of the things that it's it's what you just touched on was that I didn't want to make these people just Nazis because yeah. in a lot of stories that we see even being made today, Nazi is the Nazis are kind of made out to be like this this almost army of superhuman people, but yeah. really it was just a political party in yeah. the forties in Germany. Yeah. Obviously, it was a fascist political party, and and it was terrible. But it, it was just that a pol political party, mm. and a lot of Germans at the time felt like they were being forced or manipulated into joining the party. Yeah, and a lot of it came with quite, you know, dire consequences if they didn't join. Yeah, a lot of the times, you know, your family's life is on the line, or mm. being able to feed your family, or even your own life. Mm. So it was very, very difficult. It was a very difficult time for them. And yeah, I wanted to to draw these characters with all these different shades because I think as humans, we were unwilling to acknowledge what, what we would do in someone yeah. else's situation. Yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't my it wasn't my place to condemn certain characters and congratulate other characters. Mm. It was simply to write them in a way that made them seem like they could be our friends. Yeah. And that's the way I went with it. Yeah. And in fact, that's one of the key messages, isn't it? That uh, Joseph himself, you know, uh, I think he even says at one point in the book, you know, so what would you have done? You know, yeah. if you, if, if you were in my, my situation, you know, he acknowledges his own guilt, if you like. Uh, and this, of course, for for Germans in real life, you know, as I know, because I've lived in Germany uh, and for certainly for a particular generation, there's this whole kind of notion of the war guilt, uh, which uh, has now gone through, you know, two or three generations. And um, I think it's a very interesting thing uh yep. for a whole kind of nation to carry that burden on going and of course quite right we must never forget you know lest we forget is as the saying goes we must never forget what happened of course we should we should never allow it to you know history to repeat itself but of course it's um in terms of the Nazi party and so on, uh, that's that was happening in Germany, whilst, of course, you had Stalinism and, you know, that kind of communism going on in Russia at the same time. And, of course, it's, yeah. let's be honest, in historical terms, it's a bit of a toss-up as to which was worse. You know, you can't really make those kind of comparisons. But it's not yeah. something that was exclusive to Germany. But it is... Uh, it's a very powerful kind of message, isn't it, that something like this can happen in the midst of what considered itself to be a very civilised, very cultured, very open society. I mean, Germany in the 1920s, the Weimar Republic, another part of German history that I've studied, it was incredibly cosmopolitan. People from all over the world would gather in Berlin and other German cities, Munich, uh, because of its diversity, because of its culture, because of the music, because of the art and so on. And it's out of a culture like that that National Socialism sprang, which is, you yeah. know, that's a, a warning bell to all of us, isn't it? Exactly. And so, so, I mean, so in terms of if you thought you you want the readers to come away with, if you like, a core message from the story, Lauren, uh, for you, what 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 is that core message that you'd want readers to take away? 
Um, for me, it's my my novel is is uh, is it's an anti hate novel essentially. Yeah. Whenever I was doing my research, I realized that even Germans today are still kind of plagued by their pasts. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you hear stories about Germans that can't fly their flag at football matches without someone shouting Nazis at them, mm. which which is insane. Um, and obviously, hatred is still very prevalent in today's society. I mean, you only have to look at the news. <laughs> Sadly, yeah. you only have to look the news to see that now, too. There's yeah. a lot of different race um, groups of people that are still being, um, you know, targeted and, mm-hmm. and hated just because of who they are. And I think it's it's just very important that that we we, we never forget the lessons of our past. Mm-hmm. And we, we try and move forward. Um, writing the novels helped me realize how far we've come but also how far we've yet to go yeah and it's it's really sad to come to that realization that things aren't so different than what they were in nazi germany yeah the things could very easily become that again yeah yeah i think even during this pandemic because we're recording this uh on the first of june 2020 and uh of course lockdown is just starting to be eased uh but it's we've seen all through the pandemic how easy it is for tribes to form the people who conform to the lockdown regulations and the people who don't conform to the lockdown regulations uh, you know yeah. the, the people who can afford to do certain things and the people who can't afford to do certain things the people who clap for the carers the people who don't clap for the carers it happens all the time doesn't it that 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 our society very quickly uh even without us kind of noticing consciously can split into tribes and of course you're absolutely right lauren you know that it it's not just what happened in nazi germany it's what's happened throughout history uh and it's just one of those perennial problems that uh we need people people of reason uh in charge to make sure mm. that it doesn't escalate but of course it can very very quickly escalate uh, and one of my little stories is that you know when I, I did a year abroad in Germany as part of my degree and that my landlord had been in the SS yeah. he had been in the Waffen SS and he proudly showed me his little SS tattoo under his under his arm and wow. um, he'd fought at Arnhem against the British paratroopers and stuff and it was a Let's just say I avoided contact with him as much as possible because he was he was trying to apologize to me for what he'd done. Oh no. Um which was very weird, right? Oh, um weird. but it was also, also you kind of got the impression because he'd volunteered for the SS, right? So it's like right. how sincere is that apology? lots and lots of complicated questions and 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 some of those things have lived with me ever since but anyway uh i think this is where your your novel's remarkable because for certainly for anyone who knows anything about the history of that period wow it unlocks all these little pandora's boxes of gosh yes that's really complicated and and the thoughts going through the boy's head and what's happening with the teachers and and the wider aspect of germany and so on there's a lot Mm. of really really powerful stuff in there but as i say it's what i love about your book lauren is it's balanced by this kind of much more intimate stuff which is you know uh extraordinary extraordinary now the book comes out uh in is in various formats the the launch date the official launch date is the 6th of june which is d-day ta-da yeah yeah. I think we dreamt that up between us, didn't we? Uh, so it comes out on D-Day and there's paperback, there's hardback and the Kindle version, of course. And we yep. should reveal to the listeners that I've started work on the audiobook version. Yay. Yay. Which, because uh, as if you haven't given me enough work already, Lauren. <laughs> I know. Like I just keep piling work. <laughs> <laughs> on top of you i'm just like oh and also let's let's do this too uh, and no complaints uh, no complaints <laughs> in fact i think we should reveal to readers that um 
the audiobook thing has sort of come about almost by accident because I thought because we'd been working hard together on getting the you know the, the the physical copy of the book done and the Kindle copy of the book done and I just thought oh I'll help out Lauren with a bit of you know pub publicity and I recorded the prologue from the from the book for you. Yeah. So so you went yay and grabbed hold of that and <laughs> shoved it out into the world which is which is wonderful and I gather must have had a reasonable amount of feedback because then yeah. then we started talking about well what about the whole book as an audio book thing um which for me is fantastic you know i've um i've sort of i've kind of built myself a bit of an audio career of one kind of another or another over the last couple of years and then when it's like the the reality of what record the whole book all ninety thousand words but only some seemed a little bit more daunting well that's when you know i don't often suffer from imposter syndrome but it was suddenly that oh my god <laughs> right because yeah. recording an audio book it's it's a performance it's not just sitting there going and then they did this and then they did that it's like you've got all that emotion that we've just talked about that's in your book i've got to try and convey in the audio book so i'm in the middle of you know getting started on recording that and we're hoping to have that out i think we've said august haven't we lauren august yeah that's that's yeah that's the d desired launch date for that so let's hope yeah everything goes to plan for us uh, i'm sure it will i'm sure it will yeah um so y your book's available in lots of formats and um so you've made use of and we'll give them a shout out the, the the lovely woman that i know rob uh robin cutler of ingram spark uh ingram yep. spark have been uh tremendously useful for you i'm sure uh, obviously the kindle's yeah. going to be amazon and you know other outlets um and there's paperback and there's hardback and then the audiobook in due course will probably be amazon acx or you know one of the others uh which we'll tell people about at the time so now you've reached this point lauren right it's it's reality yeah. it's gone from that that spark of inspiration you had back when you were what 16 i think you said that oh i'd quite like to write, write yeah. a book and then over the <laughs> following years right um you know, heading for heading on for a decade. You know, you it, it it's turned into this extraordinary story, and now it's just about to go out into the world. How do you yes. feel about that? How does that make you feel? It's it's a very bittersweet feeling because I, whenever I set out to write this novel, I wrote it in a way that 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 I thought nobody would read it. It would never be published. And because of that, I was able to really inject myself into it and write what I really wanted to. And I think that's how a lot of these very intimate details and personal moments come up. Yeah. So, so the the fact that it's going to be out there in the world, it's 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 insane to me. Um, but I'm happy. It's it it doesn't just belong to me anymore, but it belongs to everyone. No, and I hope that since it's meant so much to me i hope that it means something to somebody else too and i hope that it can help other people as well i'm sure it will i mean and, and uh, you know having written stuff myself i i do completely understand what mm. you're saying there about that moment when you realize that it's it's changed it's not just yeah. yours anymore it belongs to the world in a sense um yeah it's a very very powerful moment but also i i i know whenever it was a couple of weeks ago now when you got your first proof copies of the book through the post right and you took a selfie and, oh look it's my book it's real <laughs> uh, i know there's nothing quite like that is there opening that package and there's the smell of it and everything it's like oh my god it's real it's really really real that's an extraordinary moment yeah no absolutely i i remember whenever it was it was shipped i was i was waiting yeah. patiently by the mailbox every single day and when it when it finally came it, it it like you said it was a very surreal feeling holding something in your in your hands that you've worked on for so many years yeah because for me it was it was it was almost like a like a routine for like what was it five or six years yeah of just sitting down and writing and I was with these characters so long and they they they, they impacted me too yeah. um the the characters and the story itself actually 
I know it sounds a little bit insane, but they they actually changed my life. They changed how I think about things. Sure. Whenever I come into a little bit of hardship, I think, how would um what what would Joseph think of that? And because mm. of the way this fictional character would would, would react, I I alter the way I would as well. That's really interesting. Yeah, because you've yeah. you've created a being, haven't you? You've created yeah. a voice in your own head. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Which, under other circumstances, would be classed as madness, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, hey, uh, as authors, we get to be mad for a living, which is fantastic. Um, I know. It's wonderful, yeah. So that you've got that amazing <laughs> moment. And, of course, uh, so there's been two journeys. There's been the journey of writing the story, creating those characters, bringing them to life. And there's been the parallel journey of... Uh, turning this idea into a physical thing you know that's that moment isn't it when you hold the book in your hands and and something that was purely inside your head now has a, a physical manifestation right it's a book it's a thing yeah. and people are reading it and when my first book uh, came back from the pub from the publishers, uh, and mine's a bit of a beast. It's a five hundred and twenty page hardback monster <laughs> that weighs uh, nearly two kilos. So, I that really had a genuine physical impact. It's like, oh my goodness, you <laughs> warmth, you know, there's a thing. But there's there's been that other journey of turning, as I say, what was inside your head into a physical thing. I mean, also a kind of a digital thing for Kindle and what have you, but. So what do you think you've learned along the way of the journey to self-publication? What do you think you've learned about the writing community, the publishing community, all the because you've obviously, obviously as a self-published author, there's you suddenly have to grapple with a whole load of other technical stuff as well. Uh, you've started uh, uh, successfully so far from what I can tell but obviously ongoing now for months to come there's all the marketing and so on that's going on so so what do you think you've learned along the way is there anything you would have done differently had you realized what it was going to be like uh and what are the things that you feel like definitely yeah I got that right actually and that's something I'd want to pass on to other people Laura Oh God! Um, d don't get me started in terms of things that you would you would like to change. I think I think it's only natural, actually. Yeah. Um, there are a few glaring examples of decisions that I would reconsider, but I think that's a good thing in the end. Yeah. Um, the way I think of it is, it's the, the novel is exactly what I wanted to be in the point of time that I finished it, mm. and and that's enough. I think if you're not looking back with a little bit of um, thoughts on how you could have changed it, it means that mm. you're not ready to grow and write something better. Yeah. Um, you know, but there's there's always there's always going to be that little bit of doubt. And for new writers, the biggest piece of advice that I would I would get is just to try and push through that doubt as much as you can. Right. Um, there's always going to be the voice in the head that's your head that's telling you kind of how. You, you know, worthless your writing is, how it's never going to be published, you know, that kind mm. of, um, you know, that the kind of doubt. Um, yeah. Imposter but, syndrome. But imposter syndrome, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, but you, you you know that you're a writer when you keep showing up at your desk every day just despite that voice. Yeah. Um, you know, ultimately you do become a little bit of a sparring partner with the voice in your head. <laughs> and yeah. it, it's your harshest um, editorial eye, yeah. you know, as you as you try and um, fight and feel your way through it. But, but, but I think, I think all of that kind of stuff improves you as a person because you've come through this really tough self-examination and you've taken on something that you might not have been able to win against, but you have. Yeah. Yeah. And now you have this finished product that, that you can share with the world. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Um, yeah. It's almost like you've proved something to yourself. Yeah, exactly. Uh, dis and despite that demon on your shoulder that says you're useless, you're never going to finish this, and so on. Yeah, sometimes you're your own worst critic. Absolutely. Where? So, what? Uh, on the other hand, what things do you think you did right? You know, where where you've made decisions and you think, yeah, that was absolutely the right decision. Um. So I think self publishing was something that I that that I that I thought I did right, and I would recommend that to the others. Mm -hmm. obviously it isn't 
it isn't going to be for everybody. But for me, it really was because I was able to have a hands on, um, uh, you know, I was able to have hand on approach with my own novel and it wasn't just passed yeah. about to all these different people and I had no say in it whatsoever. Mm. I was able to give input on the cover design and, you know, the editing mm. and the video trailer and, and all those things. Mm. So I think that's one thing that I, I definitely did do right. And going with Ingram obviously was was a wonderful idea as well mm. because they were able to give me guidance when I when I needed it and yeah they they, they were wonderful to work with yeah I mean uh, as I say I've been lucky enough to meet Robin Cutler on a couple of occasions and yeah I wish more companies had people in charge like her <laughs> let's just say I think the yeah. world would be a better place that's that's <laughs> for certain Absolutely. um and, and uh obviously now you've become part of an exclusive you know, kind of community, the self-publishing community, mm. uh, who are very, very active online. I mean, how how do you feel about that? Have you felt supported by the writing community, Lauren? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I came across writing community for the first time on Twitter, actually. I think that's where they're most active. Mm. And, and yeah, they've been, they've been very, very supportive. Um, being on Twitter has opened a lot of doors for me that I wouldn't have otherwise... Um, being able to, um, for example, I was, I was part of a, a virtual book tour that that our own right organized on Twitter. Right. Yeah. So that was really cool. I got to meet, I got to meet other, you know, wonderful authors that I've become good friends with, and we were able to share our novels with each other. Mm. So I think that's a wonderful experience. Yeah, because I, I noticed actually, because um, you're on Instagram as well. Uh, yeah. and facebook but you've got a lot of followers lauren uh it's it's quite noticeable i mean one of the things that always startles me because i inhabit you know on, on social media generally speaking i'm in a bit of a niche because my shtick is kind of military history and war gaming and that kind of stuff uh yeah. and and in that very small pond i'm a reasonably big fish and i think gosh you know i've got you know two and a half three thousand followers you've got yeah. bazillions of followers lauren and you've and you've only just started on your journey so that's that gives you a great head start and i think it's fair to say that these days uh as someone who has been both published traditionally and self-publish now yeah uh actually working social media is really a skill isn't it and and yeah. making sure that you have a presence there because certainly if you're be if you've been traditionally published the brutal facts are as i've mentioned before you know in various podcasts i've done the brutal facts are that nowadays publishing companies expect the author to do something like 90 percent plus of their own marketing nowadays traditional publishers their idea of marketing your book unless you're a very 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 big name author like a jk rowling right uh their idea of marketing your book is uh yeah we put it in the catalog that goes out yeah, our website two, four times a year it, and we put it on our website and yeah. if you're lucky when it's first published we might do a tweet uh and so and people may find it they may not who knows <laughs> yeah yeah and so the fact that you are very very active on social media gives you a head start and certainly you know I, one of the things that's great you know f from my point of view seeing how you've already got well started you got yourself some interviews haven't you on local radio you've been in local yeah. papers you've been you found these kind of contact groups online that help publicize books and stuff i mean that I, i'm sure it's fair to say Lauren, that you've you were probably already aware of that necessity long before you ever finished writing the book yeah yeah no absolutely i i knew very early on how important it was to gain a following before the book was even finished yeah. Because then people would would be able to see kind of what your what your deal was, what you like to write about most. Yeah. And whenever your novel finally does come out, people know you enough to know like, oh, I, I like this person, so I'm going to give her a go. Yeah. And I think that's really worked out for me because the the novel it, it's only pre order at the moment. It doesn't yeah. come out till the sixth of June, like we said before. But it's it's been doing incredibly well online so far. Yeah, did it get to number one pre-order on Book Depository or something? It's yeah, it's currently still a bestseller on a best-selling pre-order on Book Depository, but also a best-selling um, historical fiction novel. Wow! So 
it's it's quite good. I, I think I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting at two eighty eight or something like that, which which is insane, wow. you know, for book depository because, I mean, they have some quite big names there too. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. That's a, that's a, an amazing achievement, Lauren. So hats off to you yeah. for doing that. And we haven't even put out the book trailer yet, which is going to be finished in the next couple of days, and which, uh. I think it's fair to say we're quite excited about. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think if nothing else, the book trailer conveys the power of the emotions that are in the story. I mean, the thing, this is one of the challenges, isn't it? You know, because when, when you first start thinking about a book trailer, because, I, you know, we all do it. We imagine this kind of epic movie and then you realise, <laughs> yeah, that's going to need like 90 minutes of film. <laughs> Yes, no, absolutely. we have 60 seconds, right? We have 60 yeah. seconds to convey something, just something about the book. So we focused on you, you, you know, you're a very talented young woman and you'd already had some ideas and you sent me um, a few weeks ago now some kind of these are some initial ideas I had. And you'd even put together a little sequence in iMovie. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was so struck by, by how powerful that you know the the basic concept you come up with was that i decided to stick with that for the creation of the you know what's going to be the final thing and i think that's you know from my point of view one of the things i've been so um you know overjoyed by throughout you know the relationship that we've built over months now many months is that uh it's really lovely when uh the author and designer and in my case designer and other things w w you kind of find that you're on the same wavelength right because yeah. if, yeah. if you if you don't achieve that really quickly then it just makes everything so much harder um and to be honest you know it just i i'm so grateful that you fell into my lap as it were lauren because it's like i can't believe how much of what you've done uh really excites me you know the period of history the nazi germany stuff the wartime stuff and the sheer kind of uh rawness of the emotions that are being conveyed um and then you know and now i'm recording the audiobook and i'm having to i've got to warn the readers i'm ha i'm having to stop every so often <clears throat> because i i keep you know choking up there are some really kind of powerful bits of the story but there are so many moments in the story that i you know, I really want to help, you know, convey in the audiobook version uh, and, you know, hope that my performance is up is up to the task. We shall see. No, I'm sure I'm sure it will be the like I said, the we talked about before the prologue mm -hmm. the little snippet that you gave is 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 wonderful. And it's got quite a good response on on social media. So I, I think it'll be it'll be really good. It'll be a really special audiobook. Well, I hope so. And and of course the thing is, uh, then come August and I finish the audio book, <clears throat> and in a sense, you know, that's that's it's a wonderful time because hey, we've everything we said we were going to do together, we've done. It's also a sad yeah. time because it's like I particularly know. in our case, we'd have been working together for you know the best part of a year, uh, which yeah. is we have to say probably not normal in the self-publishing industry there's so many times where someone says oh henry can you do me a book jacket and i send them some visuals and they say oh yes i like number three can you just tweak it a bit and in the space of two or three weeks that's it you know yeah and it's yeah there's no no further contact or, they or pay the invoice like and off they go into the sunset obviously i wish them well obviously if they're writing a series you know, and there are some some of my lovely author friends who are writing series, and they come back to me every you know few months. Say, oh, it's number three's ready, number four's ready, which is which is wonderful. But there are you yeah. know quite a few. It's just a one-off thing. I think that's the nature of the self-publishing world as well. Often, is that people just feel like they've got a book in them, a story in them, or their own life story that they want to get down on paper and get out into the world. And that may be the only thing that they ever write. And that's yeah. fair enough. Whereas there are other people who are seeing writing, writing as a career. This is now what I do. So yeah. in your case, Lauren, once August comes and the audio book's out and you're rolling in your millions because the book's been so successful, <laughs> right? You're the next JK Rowling. <laughs> right um, of course the, the obvious follow-up question is what next have you got plans for another book or books uh yes actually i've i started outlining for book two actually and 
it's not going to take place in Nazi Germany. It's going to probably going to take place in my hometown, um, Derry. It's going to be about the the, the troubles, oh, which right. again I I don't think a lot of people know about. So I think mm. it's important that we get a story out there about that too. And obviously, I've I've a lot of firsthand experience because I I grew up in the country that mm. the story is going to take place in. So yeah. some some very exciting things coming. Yeah. Uh, that's fascinating because, of course, again, you know, the Troubles. I lived through the mm. Troubles. Um, and it's another form of tribalism, isn't it, Lauren? Yeah. You know, you've been writing about you know, tribalism, politics in Nazi Germany and so forth. And, of course, the Troubles it was all about mm. tribalism of one form or another. So yeah, uh, that's going to be interesting. Very, very interesting. Total change of kind of direction in some ways but i can see not necessarily yeah. in others so have you already sort of started outlining that story yeah i've, I've started outlining I, I haven't really got anything to do with characters yet but um j- j- just general story i've started outlining and i know for sure that i wanted to take place in in dairy right and really that's all i know for now and that's oh, well that's a start that's a start for now yeah I mean, the, one of the writery questions that you know everyone likes to ask is: Are you a plotter or are you a pantser? Are you someone who wants to plan out everything to the nth degree, or are you someone who just puts your backside in the chair and out it comes, and hopefully it ends up you know all tying up at the end? Which are you, Lauren? I'm definitely a pantser. I, I if I if I write out a plot, if I write out like an outline of what I want to do, I almost never follow it anyway so I just thought you know there's no point um yeah like you said I I just sit down in front of my computer and I just start writing just Mm. whatever comes out comes out obviously there is a little bit of planning in regards to um story you know to make sure that there's no plot holes or yeah yeah or character development is is you know is good so but but no I'm definitely a pantser brilliant brilliant Okay, Lauren. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I'm really excited for you. I think it's wonderful that, you know, a a debut author can write something that's, I think, going to have a real impact. I think your book deserves Mm. to be widely known. Um, And obviously, you know, along with you, I think I'm as nervous as you are, you know, about, oh, how's the world actually going to receive this but i think already you've done you've done a great job in uh you know priming the market hopefully you know you're going to at least earn back the considerable investment you've made over many (laughs) many months to make this thing actually turn it into into a real thing and i think that's one of the other things about self-publishing that people need to realize yeah of course is you know it's the downside of not having a traditional publisher because you know they they pay for all that stuff in your case you've had to pay for you know the design Mm. you've had to pay for the editing you've had to pay for the this and the that and you know the actual you know production of the books and everything so wishing you all the very very best of luck with that and uh obviously you know looking forward to our continued association that's going to continue you know carry on for a few more months yet um and obviously once this blooming lockdown is over uh, <laughs> and the world returns to normal i'd really like to meet you lauren you know properly and... yeah absolutely in in the flesh it would be really nice to sit down and talk it really would, you know, buy a drink somewhere, whatever. Uh, I ought to come to Northern Ireland because I've, I've never actually been to Northern Ireland and everything I've seen about Northern Ireland, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. So yeah. um, we've got that to look forward to. So thanks ever so much for coming on the show, Lauren. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good luck with your book. And uh, you. ladies and gentlemen, Lauren Robinson. <laughs> This podcast was produced by Henry Hyde and featured Lauren Robinson, author of The Boy Who Saw in Colours. Copyright Henry Hyde, 2020.